Hello, I'm Devin, and today I'm joined by three good friends, Andy Matushak, Star Simpson, and Michael Nielsen. Andy's a software engineer, designer, and researcher, and he works on technologies that expand what people think and do. Star is a hacker and founder. She's working on a company called Theircraft, which uses autonomous aircraft to enable air freight logistics. Michael is a scientist who helps pioneer quantum computing and the open science movement. His focus is on ideas and tools that help people think and create both individually and collectively. So today we're here to talk about one of our favorite books, uh, The Art of Doing Science and Engineering. And I'm really excited because we're all good friends, uh, but we also haven't talked that much about this particular book together. So we're gonna have a lot of fun uh, diving into, into this book, what it means to us, and ideally where we disagree on, on the interpretation too. So for starters, in The Art of Doing Science and Engineering, the author Hamming puts forth a transcendental narrative. Uh, he answers the question of what matters. And something that I've heard Andy say is that Hamming's religion is the unabashed pursuit of excellence. So what does excellence mean to Hamming and what does it mean to you? Hamming has a really specific definition of, of excellence. He's interested in uh, people understanding fundamental properties of reality uh, more accurately and, and sharing that knowledge with others. One, one of the things that I think is most interesting about his view is it's not even so much uh, excellence or, or, or what he means by that, but the unabashed side of it. I, I think it's really interesting to read this book in 2020, an irony-laden society or something like that. Uh, the, the kind of like earnestness uh, that, he, that he brings to his narrative is, is really interesting to me. Uh, he's is like, well, of course you want to you know, do great things. And since you naturally want to do great things, uh, you know, here are some considerations. And I think it stands in, in really stark contrast. Uh, a lot of stances these days where I, I think it's difficult to, to talk doing excellence seriously and not either come off as delusional or as like self-aggrandizing or uh, arrogant or just out of touch or something like that. And so. I enjoy that part of it. What's changed? Well, Hamming was part of a, a generation that I think took kind of a, a shared project of progress and understanding uh, very just uh, among scientists, but even society, uh, kind of grand projects of the mid 20th century, uh, the counterculture movements, I, I, I'm spitballing here, uh, and mm, kind of grunge and Generation X. Uh, mm, kind of stereotypical cynicism perhaps er eroded some of this. I, I guess I'm not really sure. I'd be curious what others think. Well, I think Hamming was kind of a rare person. Uh, and it's not just that he was this very clear thinker. Uh, he also had a lot of self-awareness, which is very unique quality in any person. And furthermore, was committed to communicating about it, Right. So, like, each of those things, like himself being an astute observer, uh, you know, being uh, self-aware about what, you know, what worked to enable that, and also being committed to communicating to others, I think are the things that make Hamming, you know, so unique and his writing so unique and so genuine. Yeah, my, my instinct is that there's, there are a lot of people who are very good at science. And there are also a lot of people who are very uh, interested in communicating about science, but the the overlap isn't necessarily particularly strong. It felt like with Hamming, he had these amazing discoveries, did great mathematics. And then he said, wow, this is so great that I have to share both this work and also my process and the process of great people around me with people, as opposed to sort of com communicating about science for science's sake. Yeah. And he was right about you know, his ideas, but he was also right about, you know, what are the right things to do? Uh, it all stacks up, you know, in such a, such a unique way, such an interesting way. It's, uh, it's great, I think, that he didn't just give us the artifacts of his concepts, but also gave us, you know, what he had studied along the way uh, to become a person able to discover concepts. That's what I love about the book. Michael, what do you think made Hamming special? Can I come back uh, to Andy's uh, comment? I want to disagree completely, um, which is uh, very unusual for me. Yeah, Andy made this comment. Essentially, I, I would say it's almost sort of a, a nostalgic comment about maybe past generations being more interested in excellence. I don't think you can conclude that from Hamming at all. 
Hamming was at the 99.99th percentile of being interested in excellence for his own generation. I'm not sure you can actually infer very much about what was typical for people. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's fair. I, I think uh, it's, it's not so much uh, that prior generations, I think, were more interested in excellence necessarily, but rather that um, I think it was more okay to express an interest in excellence. I'm curious I, I, I don't think that's true either. Um, okay. You know, if you walk into a bookstore, which of course you can't do at the moment, you know, there'll be like masses of shelves that are basically about nothing but the pursuit of excellence in a whole lot of different ways. Um, and so, yeah, and I mean, they're routinely some of the highest selling uh, books. I mean, some of them are not framed as excellence exactly, you know, being becoming the I don't know, millionaire next door or something like that isn't quite about that. But there's certainly, I don't know, the seven habits of highly effective people. And there's like a thousand titles like like that. And they sell millions of copies. So, so I think people are pretty interested and they're, they're pretty willing to, to accept it. Hamming, I, I do think, was a little bit unusual in, you know, he has this very precise articulation saying that even though a lot of people are sort of nominally interested in this, they don't actually necessarily take the, the specific actions uh, to act on it. You know, he, he makes this comment about going and talking to some of the other scientists at some of the, you know, at the lunch tables and saying, you know, what are the important problems in your field? And some of them saying, well, I don't, you know, don't really know. And uh, even if they did know, you know, why are you not working on them? Uh, and um, discovering that this made him, apparently, at least some of the time, not a very popular lunch companion. And that's, I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, it might be a constant between his time and our time. I'm not, not sure, but uh, it, it's certainly an interesting observation. I think that really speaks to kind of what amazes me is the nuts and bolts level of detail about his advice. Can you give what, an what's another example? Well, you know, as contrasted to self-help or self-improvement guidebooks, I think Hamming doesn't put it in the spirit of like, look, if you just drank a few more glasses of water every day, you'd like think more clearly. He really lays out that like, it's hard work. And the thing you need to do more of is work, right? And talk to people. He advocates a program of like studying past uh, eminent discoverers and trying to like piece apart what their discovery process had been, for instance, like uh, what prior knowledge allowed them to like make that insight? What was it about their context or their environment that enabled that? And then trying to like shape his own environment around that. So thinking very carefully about, you know, when and how often to have one's door open, uh, how to piece apart one's work into kind of thinking big picture versus like, you know, working on very tactical tasks. Uh, how to look at a, a new field that's emerging uh, and kind of decide when to when to like jump into it. Uh, he advocates like thinking very carefully about all of these things. I, I think that's very much right, but I also also think it's quite challenging to actually study the context that somebody is in. So there's no lack of biographies out there and histories, but I always ha have this nagging sense when I read a biography that it's just a just so story and you're not actually learning much at all about what really mattered for having this person succeed. Sometimes it's partially about motivations, like pe people want to tell a different story that and make it a little bit smoother because it's cleaner. Sometimes it's just people forgot the details and it just didn't really come up or didn't seem relevant to the author. But I found personally that like I I've started, I've been reading fewer and fewer biographies in my life and just trying to spend time with people who I think are doing good work because then you can actually see firsthand what it is that enables them to do that and like what their their patterns of thought are um but that means you have to like be around certain types of people and like this is one of the reasons why I love being friends with people like you um but how, how can you scale that beyond just becoming friends with people scaling what in particular Devin scaling what experience let's say in high school um, I, I did not have access to the kinds of friends that I have now. Uh, I didn't know Twitter existed. I didn't have the email etiquette that I now have. I didn't live in San Francisco. I didn't have a driver's license. I couldn't get to the people I wanted <laughs> to get to. And so I, I was kind of stuck with reading biographies. Um, yeah. And so like how, how would a 14-year-old get more of this context so that they can start learning as opposed to having to be in their 20s and living in a, a great city or a great like university? Something that, that is certainly, you know, a lot of fun is, uh, uh, you know, watching sort of Twitch live streams of people doing interesting things uh, because, you know, you're not actually getting their kind of reconstructed just so story about how it is they did what they did. No, you're actually seeing them do the thing. Um, uh, maybe sort of an even more fun uh, example in some ways 
um, I mean, you, you can you can do this um, sort of. I mean, with anything that you can see done for sort of live action. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what's the name of the, the greatest snooker player in the world, Ronnie O'Sullivan. Um, you know, he claims that he put himself to play snooker basically by watching videos of uh, the previous best player in the world, uh, Stephen Hendry, uh, uh, and just imitating him at the age of 10, 11, 12. Uh, and that's pretty cool that, that he can sort of do that, that you know, self-tutorial uh, uh, sort of just by searching out, well, searching out video and, uh, and, and, and watching. So I guess the takeaway is that more scientists should be on Twitch. Um, actually, so I, I know somebody uh, who was at Stanford uh, who did live stream, in fact, their, you know, you know, a, a substantial chunk of their PhD, um, uh, which I thought was pretty great. Um, and there's, you know, there's other things. There's a, a company, uh, what is it called? Uh, Jove, uh, the Journal of Visualized Experiments, who will send a, a camera crew to your lab uh, and actually show you, you know, actually video you as, you know, you uh, arrange, I don't know what, what what you do, you know, arrange the pipette in, in just the right way to do the, you know, the procedure. Um, and I think that's, I don't know, it's pretty interesting. Like you, you kind of just learn stuff by seeing people do things uh, for real in a way that you can't learn from I, I sort of I don't entirely agree with you about biographies but there is definitely a lot left out there are good biographies but it's really hard to know if it's true or not um, and I think biographies for me serve more as sort of inspiration of people doing great things and I just get really excited about doing things in the world when I read biographies but it's less of a manual about how to how to um, usually um, I find often interviews, like especially less um, like highly edited interviews, are, are often good for for getting uh, somewhat less just so stories. I mean, of course, you'll still get them, but sometimes you'll get these little these little gems where the interviewer will ask, "Well, like, how did you think to do that?" And the person was like, "Well, you know, I, I just encountered this other person who was doing this thing." Um, it, it's kind of similar to the Twitch vibe, where you kind of like you, you see how the stumbling happens. I think another dynamic you see in biographies is there's often selection for people who have become fairly you know, noteworthy for whatever reason. And there's a subtle effect where when you're, you know, whatever you want to call it, senior, um, often folks end up with others sort of working under their name, you know, doing a lot of the, the gumshoe work, uh, you know. And so I've seen a lot of biographies, I don't want to single anyone out particularly, but I am thinking of one where in the beginning, this guy was like, I, you know, I had to get a like medical exemption. So they didn't send me to war. And so I threw the paperwork off the side of my motorcycle and like ran over it a few times to make it look, you know, whatever. It's like very tactical, you tactile as well. And, you know, then by the end of it, he's like, yeah. And then um, we invented, you know, and he's really kind of encompassing a few hundred other people when, you know, with that we, but like, you know, he, you sort of, you, you get the sense that as much as the vision never faded, um, that person stopped having their fingers, you know, in the, in the paint. Um, and, and Hamming's book is again, like particularly noteworthy because he's so blunt about the requirements. What's the more examples of the bluntness? Sir? This is referencing what Andy mentioned earlier where he goes into detail about, you know, how often to have your door open, you know, to acknowledge very specifically, some people can get more work done with their doors closed. However, they're more likely to diverge away from doing like what we collectively think is like useful and interesting. That's his tactical, like, and that's also like a very interesting thought. It's not an idea that I've really heard anybody else address. Like to the extent I thought of it on my own, it was really just sort of like, wandering off in my head and it's like not the kind of thing I would imagine being able to sort of like air in a workplace not the average workplace of like you know mm. so how often should I have my door open in order to be most productive it's not like a mm. not a thing that question you know and like mm. and then he just went and wrote it down mm. I enjoy the um uh he re refers to John Tukey uh quite frequently uh and there's also kind of a similar slightly in your face quality about some of those references you can see yeah, you know, when he was referring to somebody like Shannon, who was a little bit older, you know, he admired him, but he didn't really view him as a peer. And so it was kind of more of a, almost sort of a mentor, you know, or somebody who he looked up to. But Tukey was about the same age, and you could see 
that he felt competitive with Tuki and a little bit jealous that Tuki was so good. And, you know, there's, I don't know, just all that the, sort of the, the discussion of, you know, what made Tuki so good. And uh, there's a, a great uh, moment sort of, I think in much the same vein of just, uh, I think he, he goes to, to talk to his boss and complains, how can Tuki know so much? And his boss leans back in his chair and says, uh, you too would be surprised if you worked as hard as John Tukey, how much you know. <laughs> like, okay, right. And he makes this great point from that about, about kind of the compounding nature of, of knowledge and, and that, you know, kind of small marginal investments may return. I, I'll just share like one other kind of blunt thing. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it. I love all the instances where he kind of complained about his own failure. Um, and, and he has... Uh, a couple actually where he talked about essentially he was going with cached thoughts. Like he had come to some conclusion about, uh, I think it was digital filters uh, based on some like prior nature of the field. And so he missed um, this opportunity that, that one of his colleagues uh, ended up pursuing uh, rather than him. And he felt kind of frustrated about that. Like I should have gone after that. And the reason that I didn't was that I'd already decided that that approach wasn't going to work. And so when the situation on the ground changed, uh, he didn't reconsider and uh, he, he kind of exhorts the readers in the, in the AI chapters, uh, for instance, that you know, almost everybody who's kind of talking about the, the future of AI is, is just kind of repeating other people's conclusions. You need to like sit and like, do your own thinking and update your thinking, and otherwise you're going to have no idea uh, what's, what's going to come. I really liked that f- example of the feedback about John Tukey working just harder than Hamming. <laughs> What was a time in your careers that someone gave you pretty harsh advice like that, or you're like, oh man, really got to think about this? Uh, I, I've got one that um, it, it was harsh in a, in, a, in, a, in a subtle way, but it still like really uh, kicked me quite hard. Uh, I was supposed to be responsible for um, this, this particular gesture interaction uh, on iOS and you know, I, I'd been working on it for a while and it still wasn't feeling quite right. And it was like triggering at the wrong times. And uh, after a conversation with my manager about uh, possible approaches, you know, we'd kind of come up with some ideas. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to pursue these over the next coming days. And, you know, he, he was clearly kind of interested in seeing if we could make progress a little faster. But, you know, I went home. Uh, it was, you know, maybe 7.30 or something. Uh, so I get in the next morning and he'd been there like, most of the night. Uh, and when I got there, uh, the problem was basically solved. Uh, and uh, uh, the, there, were, there was no like criticism really about not having carried it forward quite so aggressively. Uh, but uh, arriving and having the problem that I'd been wrestling with for quite some time kind of just solved uh, for me was a, a, a good kick. You never forget that feeling when it happens. I, I associate a couple of those with uh, my peers in high school. Um, my best friend in high school and I were like extremely competitive with each other. It was probably the most competitive relationship you could have with someone and still consider them your friend. And sometimes it did break <laughs> down. Um, it didn't help that my high school was tiny and we were like the two, you know, we had to be, you know, we both had these personalities. We had to be the best and everything. But then by, you know, the end of high school, you know, I was in a calculus class of four people. It was her and me and like two, two others, you know, and like it got, it got very narrow at times. Um, but I just like, you know, as hard as it was sometimes, I still really miss how intense it was because it was great. I mean, we went to school for six years and we were just like, you know, in every way, wherever possible, toe to toe, you know, it was great. When is competition productive and when is it more toxic? I think I deny the premise of the question. Toxic? Uh, well, okay. All right. Let, let me let me lean into the question. Let me let me accept the premise of the question. Um, uh, I mean, you can probably all guess, but maybe people listening to this can't. Uh, my opinion, um, mostly, you know, if you're on sort of a linear scale, like get off the scale, uh, go and do something else. Um, you, you know, I, I really enjoy. Uh, watching actually sport of all kinds. Like I love, you know, watching people play tennis. I enjoy athletics and whatnot. Uh, and so I'll admire Serena Williams or Usain Bolt or whoever. It's just wonderful. But it's also true that if, you know, 
Serena stopped, there would be a second best player in the world uh, who would take her place. Uh, actually, I guess there kind of has been over the last few years, but over the last 20 years, she's been by far and away the, the, the best player. Um, and so, I don't know, it always strikes me as somehow, you know, if there's a thousand people all competing to do the same thing, actually, probably a lot of them could go and do other things. They could invent other games. Uh, to play, uh, some of which would be unique games, games that only they in the world were playing. Uh, and it would be both more meaningful for them, it would be more meaningful for, for their family and for their friends, um, uh, and just better for the world if they were to go and do those those other things. Um, so, I don't know, competition is uh, sometimes good for motivating you, but I think you always want to be in sort of a pool small enough that it's actually to some considerable extent, friendly competition. Um, and you don't feel that the kind I hate is when you're getting crowded out and there's like 17 people all trying to do exactly the same thing. And it doesn't even feel that important anyway. Um, because in fact, you know, there's, there's kind of just too many people trying to do the same sort of thing. That's, that's, that's sort of the toxic version. Uh, I'd rather just, you know, go and find, uh, uh, ideally incredibly meaningful and important things that you can do. But we are the only person uh, or one of a tiny number of people who are pursuing that end. That's my way of thinking about competition. Not a very hemming way, I don't think. I think he was a more competitive kind of a person. He wanted to win uh, quite often. Even his framing of you know, asking what are the most important questions in your field, what are the most important problems in your field, and why are you not working on them? Um, that seems to me like kind of a silly framing. It's accepting the consensus social reality of what the field is, when in fact, it is much better very often uh, to figure out what are the problems that nobody in your field has even, you know, has understood are important yet, um, uh, sort of trying to invent new problems and maybe even new fields. Um, uh, that sort of strikes me as just a more enjoyable and ultimately more meaningful uh, activity. Um, yeah. If one is trying to uh, find a new field or at least find a new set of problems, what should they do differently from what Hamming recommends that they do? So, so yeah, some researchers, they find a problem and the goal is to, to solve that. Andrew Wiles working on Fermat's last theorem. He knew what the theorem was and that was very much the objective. And so you're always trying to find little ways of like, you know, how can I get just a little bit more insight in this direction, that direction or whatnot. Um, and people who do uh, problem discovery or even field discovery I think operate really in quite a different way. Um, they are exploring in a general direction. They're trying to find little bits and pieces of insight. They have some instinct that there's some big problem over you know, in this general direction. Um, I think maybe a good example is um, somebody like uh, Turing. In some sense, he was actually kind of working on a, a particular problem. It was a fairly esoteric logic problem that David Hilbert had, had posed. Um, in some sense, he couldn't work on the problem of discovering universal computation because nobody had said what universal computation was. The, de the, 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 the genius in that paper uh, isn't uh, proving that the whole thing problem is unsolvable, which is often how it's framed. It was inventing the concept of universal computation. Um, and almost by definition, that, that's, not a, that's not a problem. Uh, uh, yeah, that is a problem that is only evident after the fact. I think that's very often the, the, the case in, in, in science that the most interesting discoveries are not discoveries, you know, not, not solutions to problems, but rather actually identifying that there is a new concept, a new type of thing in some uh, uh, particular direction. And, and that's something that proceeds, I think, much more based on sort of instinct uh, uh, and intuition, where you're like, there is something here and I can sort of very vaguely see the outlines of it. You kind of just keep chiseling away, chiseling away, chiseling away, trying to see if there's something actually there. And probably 99 times out of 100, it turns out it was a mirage and there is nothing there. And then, you know, very occasionally somebody discovers something like the notion of universal computation. Um, and really the problem that Turing was working on was always incidental to that. Um, you know, it's wonderful that he discovered universal computation out of it. and the solution to the problem is like a nice bonus. Uh, it was kind of a, it was a way of getting there. It was almost an excuse, a provocation for getting there. I have a question for you, Michael. Much. You're going to talk more now. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> which do you think is the better 
problem discovery question of the questions posed, which are either what are the most important problems in your field or what are the, the, you know, that others are thinking about, or what are the most important problems in your field that nobody's thought of yet? Which do you think would be the better problem discovery question to ask better being you know, more productive, more likely to turn over? Ideas? Actually, I think it's, it's probably mostly, um, to some extent, it's a, it's a question of what your personality is. I'm not, not sure you even actually get to decide. Um, and, and to some extent, all I'm doing is relaying my own personality. Um, I just don't really like working on fixed problems, or I like having sort of a list of 100 or, well, not an actual list, but just hundreds of different problems, which I kind of just turn over and like, you know, you sort of consider many, many variations on the same problem, sometimes in a minute. Um, uh, uh, but it's really that process of actually revising the problem um, and sort of looking for things that seem like insights in some particular direction. Um, uh, but that, that's a personality thing and a thing about what sorts of things I am comfortable with and what sorts of things I am uncomfortable with. And I suspect that if you look at somebody who's much, much more problem oriented, like Hamming and like many, many uh, uh, scientists and, and engineers, um, uh, they would be comfortable and uncomfortable with quite a different set of set of things. But you just said you have lists of problems, so you are aware. Yeah, but the, the point is that the problems, <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> from my point of view, um, they're not the point exactly. They're almost provocations. They're almost like sort of they're steps along the way, but they're not actually they're not they're not the goal. Um, uh, you know, rather, you know, I will tweak the problem a lot. I mean, sometimes literally, uh, you know, many, many, many times, uh, sort of in a minute, just trying to find something where it's like, oh, you know, if I consider this variation, it seems to connect to this thing over here, and then all of a sudden, it's like, oh. You know, I can see some way of, of making progress, but it's it's the insight, that sort of, you know, step of connection that I think is important. Um, and I, I'm not sure I could do something like work on Fermat's last theorem. It's just like it seems so fixed. And yeah. What I feel like I'm hearing here is, uh, t tell me if this maps to what you mean, is instead of having solving a particular problem as your goal, is about sort of the process to solving that problem builds up this mental model in your head. And that model is the important thing. The problem can help you get there. It can help you sort of figure things out. Uh, but sometimes you might realize, actually, this is the wrong way to phrase the problem entirely. Actually, I, I can give a really, I mean, a really concrete example, which kind of makes sense in, in this context, because you're all very familiar with it, and Andy helped discover it. We invented this mnemonic medium over the last sort of few years. And basically, you know, we didn't think, let's set out to invent a medium that will help people remember stuff. Instead, we spent several hundred hours like just talking about um, a sort of human memory and how it works and different strategies for how, you know, you can sort of remember things and what's known about sort of human memory by cognitive scientists and so on. And separately, in apparently separate conversations, we were talking a lot about tools for thought and how media change the way people think and all these kinds of things. And in, in some funny sense, these were kind of two separate, very long conversations. And eventually, they kind of merged into one conversation where, in fact, we realized that you could build a lot of these sort of memory ideas into some sort of new medium and started to sketch that out. But it certainly it didn't come out of a problem-oriented mindset at all. Instead, it just came of pursuing these two separate, very interesting sort of sets of, of ideas. Sometimes they'd kind of come closer to each other, but most of the time they were very far apart. And I goodness knows how much time we spent sort of in those sort of separate parallel conversations before they before they merged. But there was no sense of solving a problem at all. There was, however, definitely a sense, uh, at least for me, uh, Andy can maybe speak separately, of discovering a new type of thing as a result of these conversations. Michael, I think you gave a really good answer to the prompt, so just wanted to say thanks and accept that. Um, but to draw like, what, like part B out, if I may, as well. Yeah. Uh, which is, it seems that Hamming also did not win a zero-sum game himself. He also mm -hmm. just, he, he turned over things that were not like, you know, conservative answers to questions per se, other than in a broad sense. Yeah, that seems, certainly seems, seems right to me. I wonder to what extent uh, this problem orientation has to do with this like micro-Nobel approach. Right? Does that approach encourage a somewhat more... Uh, mm, 
like pro- pro- problem solving rather than problem finding type mindset? It, it seems like it would encourage you to try to solve a problem that you can stick a name onto, um, which means that it can kind of be cleanly put boundaries around. Otherwise, you can't, you can't like put your name to an entire field in the same way. Um, now, it doesn't mean that you couldn't win a Nobel for discovering a field. In fact, many people have. Uh, but it seems like you would focus your efforts on something that, that your name ends up getting very closely attached to. Is it worth refreshing Hamming's micro Nobel idea? He has this interesting way of thinking about he's he's wondering what's my my productivity is gauged in terms of rate of micro Nobels, uh, where a micro Nobel is like a small but meaningful, substantial insight. Uh, and that seems to be his optimization function. He refers to it a, a couple of times. And this seems like a pretty different approach from like, I want to found a field. Uh, it, it's, it's much more like I want some marginal increment of insight that is original and important. All right. So this is a silly observation, but um, uh, I have to interject it. There hasn't been enough silliness. Um, uh, the uh, uh, John von Neumann pointed out that a micro century is 50 minutes which is the uh, time period uh, for, uh, in fact, a, a typical research talk. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, what that means is that unfortunately a micro Nobel, you would actually need to have one every 50 minutes in order of your entire life to add up to one Nobel Prize worth of work. <laughs> but maybe there's some kind of, you know, sort of long tail and every once in a while you get a little bit sort of lucky and, and you know, what you thought was going to be a micro Nobel worth of 50 minutes actually becomes, you know, I, I, I really, I regret really that we, we can't let Hamming off the hook for like being precise about scale and order of magnitude. So <laughs> we can't. No, it's not like he can't, he didn't find ten to the six micro Nobels. I expect he pins, like he knew what that meant, and he would have been able to draw the inference between time and <laughs> a, a cruel. Maybe he was being modest. I'm also very curious. What's a what's a mega Nobel? <laughs> That's every Nobel we've ever awarded and then some. <laughs> Can I ask a question um, of both uh, Star and Andy, and actually Devin, if you don't mind the opposition? There's this thing that I wonder as I read the artists of, of uh, uh, science and engineering. Okay, I hope I'm getting the, the title right. Um, the title wrong like every time. For, for whatever reason, it's a hard title to remember. I don't know why. The art of doing science and engineering. My God, I can't believe I'm I at the doing. There's something really interesting about it, which is so much of that book, you know, it's describing a, a research culture. It's describing a research culture that I very much recognize. And there's tons of books about research culture by all sorts of researchers. And there are many very good ones. And none of them seem to have resonated with Silicon Valley's kind of maker, doer, entrepreneur kind of a culture in the same way. And I'm just curious if you have thoughts about why that is the case. Why do so many people here get, what, what do they get out of it that's really sort of interesting and, and, and exciting that maybe they don't get out of some of the other books that have been, been written about research? I find it really relatable in a way that many books about research culture are not because so much of Hamming's descriptions are like came with his sleeves rolled up, like working with filter circuits and programming or trying to direct others to program. And it's true that, you know, we look at you know, n-dimensional space and the error correcting codes, which are arguably is his most important work. And that's somewhat less relatable. But there's so much in the book that feels like my day-to-day experience that it's very easy for me to connect to it. So it's just that kind of practical making aspect almost then to for you, Andy. You sort of feel like you can just recognize some of the things he's doing as being similar to you. That's right. Okay. Yeah, and it feels sense. like he sort of like grabbed you by the hand and sort of pulled you into into his office and then is just like, watch me do this. And he's starting he's starting to do it, as opposed to I when I read other sort of similar t- types of things, that it feels like there's much more of a description of the the problem as opposed to the action of solving the problem 
Um, yeah. And so it's like, sh- like just like what you compared it to with, with the twi- Twitch streams, it, it feels much closer to like a Twitch stream than it does to like a grand science, like this is what we figured out kind of thing. It it's really also feels- much more about the like the setting the environment that will then help you create great things, which at least for me resonates very well. And I think like for, for programmers in general, you're always sort of building yourself tools that sort of scaffold yourself to be able to build the next tool. And he's talking about these, these mental tools and these sort of environmental and mm-hmm. contextual tools that set him up for su- success. Right. And he's not just kind of considering them sort of instrumental things. I think this is what I'm taking away from what both of you are saying, but, um, and often that's the, the, the case when you read sort of scientists talking about pure science, they sort of regard sometimes they will regard the tools as just these purely instrumental things, not sort of interesting in their own right. And I guess Tamin kind of does just like them for their own right, um, which is interesting. Sorry, is that what were you going to say? It does have that quality of being kind of pulled by the, you know, the the cuff of your, you know, into office hours with a professor that you're sort of intimidated by and really look up to. And you're like amazed that you get to have some time. And what he says is, okay, look, we need to talk and here's how it works. And here's what you need to be doing. Um, And, you know, very few people are maybe even brave enough to put that down. And we talked earlier about his like competitive streak, but, you know, he also acknowledges, you know, creativity. And um, what I respect about all of that together is, um, you know, maybe especially the competitive nature. Right. We don't know if he maybe played that part up about himself. He might have. Right. But he really acknowledges that, like, um, maybe the very human part of like what what drives you uh, and in an honest way, again, that like, you know, many books are unwilling to come close to, you know, and even for, you know, maybe reasons of not wanting to overgeneralize or, you know, whatever lame reason makes the book like not land. He gives me the sense of like sort of grumpy but brilliant uncle who really wants what's best for you and he's gonna tell you the tough stuff because that's what you need to hear um in a way that is quite rare i think um and i don't think that that answers specifically the systems builder question of like you know why does this resonate with makers but i think it just makes it resonate more with people in general because when when people speak to you like you're someone that they care for and they speak to you like you can go do great things um, but you can also really screw them up if you do some dumb stuff. Then you, you take it more seriously if they're taking you more seriously. Can I go in a totally like a direction we haven't touched so far? There's a there's something I want to acknowledge about the book that is part of what makes it so special to me, and I think it's I think it's even in maybe the first or second chapter. Hamming starts using you know order of magnitude estimation to make predictions about what the world is going to do and when, you know, and to say, okay, in like 50 years, this is well beyond like my career or even my lifetime. Here's what I expect will be happening. This is um, so great for so many reasons. First of all, it's a pretty bold bet. And he must have been fairly confident about, you know, other calculations having borne out to make that call. Uh, and then also to put it in his book. Um, and it's it's very upfront. It's right there in the first chapter. Um, it reminds me of at least one other place where I've seen that, um, which is an example that I've come across recently that I found very interesting uh, since reading um, Hamming's book, uh, which is actually Jack Northrup, who founded what is now Northrup Grumman, gave a talk in 1942 saying that basically like modern aircraft were possible given uh, like a, an auto, a sufficiently advanced autopilot. Right. And he basically had like gears and linkages to work with, but he could see like not only that that direction was, would be possible and that it would be the right thing to do if it were like all he needed to make those airplanes was the right autopilot. I don't know what quality it is that links that sort of foresight, but Hamming has it. Um, and I, I am very fascinated with that, uh, you know, future looking long-term and like borne out ability to estimate. Mm. There's a, there's a, 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 a complimentary thing that I, I really enjoy. I think it's very much in the same vein. You know, he talks about, of course, computers 
sort of through the 40s and 50s were regarded as these calculating machines. You solve differential equations on them. You could predict behavior of systems. And then Hamming just has this great discussion of uh, the fact that now actually they, they, they might be meaning-making machines as well. They're not just um, about solving uh, numerical problems and doing calculations. Uh, they're about uh, solving uh, other kinds of meaningful uh, uh, human problems. And again, that seems like this is, I mean, from our point of view, because we live in that world, uh, it seems totally obvious, but at the time, it must have just been shocking and seemed so foreign to people uh, that that was sort of what, what computers might actually ultimately be about. I think that's like another really nice example of him kind of getting at the very, very heart of the problem and then seeing what the world would be like in 30 years' time. He has this claim that we don't understand what computing is for yet. And, uh, and like claims that uh, often the problem seems to be not computational power or figuring out how to make the computer do things, but rather, you know, knowing the question to ask. And that kind of still seems true today it, in many ways. It's, it's really interesting to see. What do you think would have surprised him about the state of computing today? We do so little with so much. He saw the move to VLSI, so I don't think he'd be surprised by kind of decreasing uh, core performance per watt trading off with say, multi-core or something like that. And I don't think he'd be surprised by, like, embedded CPUs becoming more and more important. So it's a little hard to say. I mean, maybe he'd be surprised by the, the prevalence of TPUs and things like that. But I, honestly, I don't think so. He talks about specialized, uh, specialized silicon uh, for, for digital filters in here. So I think specialized silicon for you know, tensor uh, multiplications is probably not surprising. He would not be surprised by video calls. <laughs> would he be surprised by the new forms of media and expression? My guess is he wouldn't be surprised, but he would be delighted. He would be he, he wouldn't predict any specific outcome, but then he would be like very excited to see that people are playing around with these things and and um, probably didn't necessarily go down all of the different tendrils of the pathways of what things became. I'm going to ask just one more question, and uh, this is for, for all of you. Um, Hamming argues that breakthroughs tend to come from deep emotional involvement, not the stereotypical calm, cool, and uninvolved mindset. Does this ring true for you? And if so, or if not, uh, how did you learn it for yourself? I mean, it, it obviously, it seems obvious to me that this is true. Um, I don't think I've worked on anything that I didn't end up having strong feelings about no matter how it began. But as far as like how I came to discover that, I don't know how to answer that. All right. Let me take the contrary view because I've, I've made the argument sort of in the other direction so many times. Norm McRae wrote a pretty interesting biography of John von Neumann. And in the biography, he makes this observation about Bertrand Russell versus von Neumann. Bertrand Russell was utterly extraordinarily brilliant, but, but he essentially claims that Russell's main problem was that he was too emotional, he got too involved in a, a lot of his work, and this is the reason why he, in fact, did not do deeper work, ultimately, whereas uh, he makes the claim that uh, one of von Neumann's strengths was his ability to remain relatively uninvolved and sort of to be a relatively emotionless. And... I don't know. I, I thought a lot about that, 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 that claim. There's at least a little bit of sympathy to it. A problem that can arise when you get too emotionally involved in your work is that actually it can start to interfere with doing it well. You can start to get anxious about how it's going to come out. You can start to get too stressed. And sometimes it's just better to chill the hell out and go and do something else for you know, either a day or in some cases six months. So that's, you know, I mean, th there's some sense in which uh, it is true, but there's kind of a, a moderation. It's maybe sort of a, a Goldilocks principle kind of a thing where you don't want to be too little involved. You don't want to be too much involved. You want to be involved at just the right level, uh, which is the kind of sentence that's really easy to say and really hard to act on in practice. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. The, the Goldilocks thing really resonates with me. I, I don't, I don't really know how to work without being emotionally involved in stuff, but I've definitely experienced problems when I've been too emotionally involved in things. And I'll just share like one consequence that that has uh, is not stopping soon enough because uh, most problems you pick up, like probably you should put down 
Uh, and uh, cho choosing when to stop work on a problem is, is this really hard thing that Hemming actually talks about some. But, but actually, I'd love to see more literature about you know, choosing when to stop working on a thing. I think being emotionally involved, uh, there's, there's several times in, in my career where uh, I have I've not dropped a project soon enough uh, and like many months over, and I, I should have. What signs should you have looked for that if you were to do it again, you could have known to stop earlier? <sighs> Yeah, first order thing to try, I think, is is kind of you know, a standard rationalist. Like try to try to write the outside view. Uh, what what did the outside view of this look like? Um, I, I probably would have struggled to write a compelling outside view for this project. I find when I have to start justifying it to my friends, um, that's a that's a sign to be like I mean, you have I, appropriately I, demanding friends. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's not, it's not always the way to go, but if, if you find yourself a little bashful to be like, ah, yeah, I'm still working on this because like it's important, but also there's all these reasons why it's like I'm not going to make progress or you know, you're working with people who who are not going to help you with that. Um that's that's a that's a, an important important I want to push back against to. that though, Devin. I, I think like some some of the most interesting stuff I've ever done has been stuff where when I'm talking about it to friends, I I feel like I have to justify it a lot. Maybe it's a different kind of justification, but basically it's like, I don't really know what this is. I mean, you know? if, you, if you've if you been working on problems that always sounded like they made sense, my goodness, like, you're way ahead. I often have a problem where, like, it doesn't make any, like, people don't sort of squint and they say, what? You know, and <laughs> you just have to sort of shrug, you know? <laughs> I have a question for Michael and Andy. I know Michael is a marginalia note taker. I, I think Andy is also. Where in this book did you make the most notes? Let's flip through and see. Uh, I mean, yeah, I have, unfortunately, the sort of trivial, boring answer, uh, which is, of course, the, the, the overlap with the, the famous essay, You and Your Research. And so, yeah, it's not a terribly interesting answer, unfortunately. <clears throat> I, I have a bunch of margin. Obviously, the, the highest density is there for me as well. Uh, the creativity chapter and systems engineering chapters, which are also kind of similar themes, um, also have a lot of highlights for me as, as well as the orientation chapter, which also has similar themes. So I, I guess like the stuff that grabbed my attention most was, uh, or at least most densely, was that type of stuff. However, um, I think some of the biggest insights from the book or like some of the points that I most enjoyed are like scattered in the middle of a chapter on digital filters. You know, I'll have like three stars in the margin or something. It's like, hey, pay attention to this. It's in the middle of this otherwise surprising chapter. How about you? It's interesting. I, I, I felt like a lot of that material is sort of, well, okay, I'm going to say something critical. I don't entirely believe it. I'm going to say that it's, it's actually kind of similar to stuff you can find elsewhere. But actually, that, that's not even true. It's still kind of interesting because he talks quite a bit more about sort of motivation than is ordinarily the case. It's embedded deeply in the material. You know, I mean, so, so I'm, I'm just like looking for these big stars right now. And, you know, so one of them <clears throat> is this short diatribe I referenced earlier where Hamming says, you must struggle with your own beliefs if you are to make any progress in understanding the possibilities and limitations of computers in this intellectual area, talking about AI. Now, like, you know, you can read like lots of essays exhorting you to do your own thinking, form your own opinions. That's fine. Um, the fact that this follows several thousand words about like reasoning prospects for AI uh, makes it much more useful. I'd say for me that actually the, the first time I read it, um, the you get what you measure. This is I read it a while ago, so the, the you get what you get measure chapter really blew my mind. And then when I reread it again recently, I had realized that I had just fully internalized all of that, and I thought it was the most boring chapter. It was pretty satisfying actually, uh, but also I kind of like skimmed through it, like okay, I get it. I, I I find that's a very common pattern for me when I learn something is things that are most shocking or hardest for me often end up then being very integrated into my worldview and my, my like abilities in a way that things that were like less mind blowing um, early on. Like I remember when I first started learning about logarithms, I really did not get logarithms. Like it was a really quite a struggle for me. And then I studied them very, very hard because I wanted to understand and then start like built that intuition. And now it's one of the uh, pieces of math that I have most deeply embedded in, in my reasoning. I have a theory that this is the case for every idea or book that was like a foundational step change. If you even go back and read a, some classic literature, it seems so boring because so many derivative works have been created that you're familiar with it before you come across it in the first place. Yeah, like Tolkien is this way for me. I actually, like, I, I know that's kind of heresy. I'm sorry. But like Lord of the Rings... When I first read it, I, I as a kid, I was like, "Yeah, this is 
this is fine. But I feel like there's a lot of other like books about elves and trolls and things like that. I don't I, I don't really understand why this is such a big deal. And then I realized, oh, this was this like invented those ideas. Oh, I see. It's a big deal. There's also a, a sense, Michael, uh, you, you've alluded to the way that lectures can have value in a surprising fashion by kind of letting you see a person's thought process in, in great detail, even if you may not absorb kind of detailed information, kind of seeing their their value system, uh, their, their lenses on the world uh, play out in the context of detailed material is enlightening. And I found, you know, chapters on digital filters and simulation uh, to be very much that way. Do you have any, any final thoughts that uh, you want to close with or final lightning round questions? I don't know. Maybe I, let, let's try this as an experiment. Uh, if you had to sum the, what you took away from the book in a one sentence, what would it be? Work hard on problems of interest to the smartest people you know. It's possible to take very, very seriously the practices of doing good work. Be proud and intentional about creating a context that allows you to do great work. I feel we should get GPT-3 to try and summarize the text. <laughs> like, right, Michael doesn't get to get off the hook, though. Like. <laughs> He's just inputting the text of the book into GPT-3. Uh, yeah, that's it's right. I'm running it at the moment. Give me yeah. a minute. Give me a minute. I'll be fine. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. What do I, I, I mean, honestly, I, I'm not sure I can. The things you said are uh, really, isn't it? Maybe actually that research is done by human beings and having things nice and human all throughout the whole darn thing. And I like that. This is a great place to stop. Thank you three for for joining, Star, Andy, and Michael. This was super fun. Thanks, David.